Hopefully you have some understanding of the structure of proteins before you go into this material here. So uh, watch the other video on protein structure to find out about the different levels, the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary uh, levels of protein structure and that'll help you understand this. So remember the primary structure is just the sequence of amino acids and the secondary structure then goes into this, the alpha helix or the beta plated sheet. So alpha helix just means um, the amino acids. So this is actually a chain of amino acids, but there might be O's and H's hanging out that can actually form these bonds with each other that are pretty strong. These are hydrogen bonds. We see them between water molecules as well too. So the secondary structure is all about alpha helixes and beta plated sheets and the bond that's holding them together keeping them in this spiral structure or in this kind of folded structure are hydrogen bonds here okay i think that's it for uh, the secondary structure but just understand primary structure is the sequence of amino acids the number in the sequence of amino acids and then we get to the secondary structure where that chain of amino acids can do uh, some mini mini folds, uh, mini spirals, and, and mini uh, sheets, beta plated sheets. Um, next we go into the tertiary structure and the tertiary structure is really where the actual shape and uh, properties of the protein actually come into play. So if it's an enzyme then we're looking for a specific three-dimensional shape. The active site on an enzyme has a specific shape and it's because of because of these amino acids and the interaction between these R groups. So here are all 20 amino acids. Make sure to memorize these. Just kidding. You don't have to do that. But each amino acid you can see has a basic structure that's similar uh, with the with the NCC here, that's the acid part, that's the amino part, and the R group in the white boxes here are what are varying between each of these amino acids, and some are hydrophobic, some are hydrophilic, some are more acid-based, some are more uh, alkaline-based, but they're very different, and how they interact with each other is going to determine um, the shape of the actual protein when it's actually produced. What are all these squiggles? Oh yes, okay. So here is a nice diagram. If you take a look at this, you can see this is the chain of amino acids. So there's one amino acid, cysteine, another one glutamic acid, another one leucine, another one aspartic acid, another one alanine. Anyways, it's a whole chain. And you can see that the highlighted bits are all the R groups. So all the regular bits are all in the middle and it's between the dotted lines. But all the R groups are what you see highlighted in yellow here. And these R groups are interacting with each other in various ways. Over here, I can already see this part here just has a lot of carbons and hydrogens. That tells me it's very nonpolar. So nonpolar things like to tend to group together. And so that's probably what's happening uh, right here. These nonpolar bits are kind of grouping together. Here's another type of interaction where you have um, two sulfurs that are close to each other and they can form something called a disulfide bridge. And then you can have some uh, ionic charges uh, and attractions that are happening around with each other as well. And so this is the importance of the tertiary structure and the types of bonds. There are hydrogen bonds that are holding this in place. There's nonpolar interactions, there's polar interactions, and the polar interactions are going to be between you know, positively charged groups and negatively charged groups. So remember the R group is variable. It's all the parts highlighted in yellow. This should be highlighted in yellow as well, too. There's 20 types of amino acids, and the 3D structure is really dependent upon how these interactions cause the entire thing to fold. So what do we have here? Uh, acidic groups can actually lose. They can lose one of their H's here, and it becomes negatively charged. Um, and then you have these parts right here that can actually have an extra H. These amino groups can add an extra H and become positively charged and these ionic bonds can actually interact with each other. If there were if there were more of this chain you could start to see some of the other interactions that are happening there. Um, I already talked about the hydrophobic interactions that can actually happen between nonpolar groups. You can recognize nonpolar groups when you just see a bunch of carbons and hydrogens with no oxygen or nitrogen in there. Disulfide bridges can form um, between two amino acids that are called cysteine and hydrogen bonds can actually form as well too which can help to hold this whole thing together and so that contributes to the three dimensional structure of the entire thing. Let's look at some specific examples of 
proteins and their functions mm -hmm. and how their structure of amino acids, what type of amino acids that are there actually help contribute to um, what they actually do. So polar amino acids have hydrophilic R groups. So equate polar with hydropho hydrophilic and nonpolar equate nonpolar with hydrophobic. So if we're talking about uh, something like this, which is an enzyme that works in water, then whatever three-dimensional structure of this thing, will, it'll probably end up folding in such a way so that the uh, amino acids on the outside are probably all going to be polar amino acids that help it to actually stick around with the water. And then in the middle are probably nonpolar amino acids which help to stabilize the structure. So all the nonpolar amino acids will kind of group together. And so this whole thing, when it folds in the end, we're simplifying it by just drawing a circle here, but it's actually a complex looking thing like this, where all the amino acids on the outside are probably polar to help it move through water easily, and the ones in the middle are nonpolar to help um, kind of keep it as a nice solid glob. If we're talking about a cell membrane here, and these are proteins that are, that are stuck inside the cell membrane, any of the ones that are in the center here are probably going to be nonpolar because it has to, right next to it are all these uh, hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids. And then sticking around on the outside bits are going to be um, polar amino acids because out here, well, the inside of a cell is all water. The outside of a cell is, is watery as well too. And so that's going to be very important. For this particular channel here, it's going to help things like glucose move through. Glucose is a polar molecule, so all these amino acids on the inside of the channel are going to be polar as well, too, to pull uh, glucose through here. And the ones on the outside that are actually touching the hydrophobic tails are going to be nonpolar to keep it embedded inside the membrane. That's pretty important. Another enzyme here. This one's pretty funky looking. This one is special. It has an active site here that has uh, specific amino acids that are going to help it to attract the substrate. In this case, it turns out that the substrate is actually negatively charged. And so it turns out that the amino acids here are all positively charged. So it's going to help the substrate be guided towards the active site. And another way to help guide that is if you have these negatively charged um, amino acids elsewhere that are going to be repelling this substrate. So when the substrate comes in, so pretend like my cursor is a substrate, when it comes in, it's negatively charged, it bumps into here, gets pushed away because it's negative, gets pushed away because it's negative, pushed away. So it's actually being pushed towards the active site and then it's positively charged here. So it's just like a boom, 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 boom and then it can sit there nice and snug inside the active site. One more, lipase is an enzyme that obviously it sounds like it breaks down lipids and um, Lipids are hard to digest because they are naturally nonpolar, but our digestive system is all watery inside. So here's a problem. Uh, these enzymes here, the enzyme lipase actually has to be able to flow through water, but it has a little flip up lid here. This is pretty creative here. A little lid that actually hides the nonpolar region. And this is where lipids are supposed to bind. And uh, when it's not being used, when it's not being used, uh, it can just float around in the fluid without any kind of problem here. And here it has a special protein cofactor uh, which binds to the enzyme and it helps lipase to bind to lipid droplets because it has a nonpolar uh, R group on its surface right here. So this is going to help to attract some lipids as well. And then when this side is revealed, mm -hmm. then it can actually work on the lipids and break it down. So there are some higher level details about proteins and specifically the structure of proteins and how it relates to the actual function. So I uh, hope that was helpful for you.